morning, NBC. Happy Father's Day for all the fathers and father figures here. It's a great day to celebrate. Um, got a few things to share with you before we continue with our worship today, and a small word to share with you as well. Um, first and foremost, we have these Connect cards that are on, on your rows. Um, I encourage you to fill those, up, fill those up if you're new among us, or if you're a regular among us, you have a prayer, or you want to connect with the church, you have a question, fill them up and drop them in the offering basket later on, or you can drop them off at the welcome desk. And if you're new among us, please go to the welcome desk, receive a small gift, and ask any questions you have uh, about this church body. And that's, um, you know, it's over there behind. The other thing is we at uh, NBC at Milton Bible Church, we do contributions. And so what does that mean? It just means that we, this is not just a one-way thing. We as a body fill into each other. And this is a biblical thing. And so if you're a regular among us and you have a word for us of encouragement, a word of truth, something from the Bible to share with us, um, or any testimony, please come and talk to me. I'm sitting over there and we can discern if this is for today and for now. And you'd be welcome to come and share. So just before we continue worship, it's kind of odd. This morning, you know, I was thinking of what to share, just if I have a verse or something to share. And I was thinking, okay, something related to like fathers. But then I woke up in the morning with a song in my head. The, an old song I used to sing when I was a kid. Uh, we bring a sacrifice of praise into the house of the Lord. I don't know if you know this song. And so I was like, why is this song stuck in my head? And then now I know we're singing about praise. And I'm like, where is this from? <laughs> and so I found that it was actually in the end of Hebrews. And it speaks, it summarizes the gospel in a way. It talks about the Old Testament. It start, and so that's from Hebrews 13. For the bodies of those animals whose blood is brought into the holy places by the high priest as a sacrifice for sin are burned outside the camp. That's the Old Testament, right? But so Jesus also suffered outside the gate in order to sanctify the people through his own blood. And we praise his name. Therefore, let us, go, let us go to him outside the camp and bear the reproach he endured. For here we have no lasting city, but we seek the city that is to come. Through him then, let us continually offer up a sacrifice of praise to God. That is the fruit of the lips that acknowledge his name. And so I encourage us to do that today for, for, for really doing what he did for us. And that do not, do not neglect to do good and to share what you have for such sacrifices are pleasing to God. So let's sacrifice today by to God an offering of praise. This one is for the fathers and all the father figures, stepfathers, grandfathers, godfathers. Whether by blood or by choice, we give voice to our gratitude for the fathers, the heroes, the mentors and anchors, the coaches and counselors, teachers and trainers, the men who shape us and show us the definition of faithful and strong and wise, the fathers always by our side, with us and for us, steady and courageous, ready to inspire and encourage and give us a word of wisdom, a voice of reason in season and out. There is no doubt where their strength comes from, what their hope is set on, who their eyes are fixed on, the fathers, the embodiment of legacy, humility, integrity, needed and necessary, dependable and trustworthy. The fathers, the men who lead and love and believe in us even when we don't. The fathers, the men who nurture and point us toward purpose, almost bigger than life, but always down to earth. The fathers, the men who give guidance, direction, and keep everything in perspective, making room for us to grow. We may never know the prayers, the tears, the sacrifices that fathers make on our behalf, yet still find time to play and laugh and rejoice in the day that the Lord has made. The fathers, the heroes, we honor you today. Good morning, Milton Bible Church. Happy Father's Day, all you dads out there. Kids, 
say happy Father's Day to your dad right now. Take the moment if you've forgotten. <laughs> um, we are entering into the part of our service where we're really going to honor our dads. And when planning, we always like to give a gift to the dads. And when planning, I asked my dad, what do you really want from the church? And he said, just a snack to have during service. <laughs> so... Dads, we have a lovely little bag of popcorn that says to the best pop in the world. Oh. Um, but going on that theme inside, there's also a special dad's root beer candy, same <laughs> pop theme there and there for you. Um, the way we're going to do this is the same as Mother's Day. We're going to invite up age groups at a time to come and collect a bag for their dad. But also we know that there's many men in this room who are like a father to so many of you. So every man in this room, we want to make sure that you get a bag of popcorn. So keep your eyes peeled around you and make sure that every single male gets a popcorn in this room. So we're going to start with our youthlings because you lead the way and you show the right way to do it. I see you guys. Stand up and come get a bag for your dad. All right. So dads, enjoy your popcorn, enjoy your candy, and I'm going to invite up Pat DeGrucci to come do a special prayer for you guys. First of all, I'd like to read something that I picked up. The author is unknown. God took the strength of a mountain, the majesty of a tree, the warmth of the summer sun, the calm of a quiet sea, the generous soul of nature, the comforting arm of night, the wisdom of the ages, the power of eagle's flight, the joy of a morning in spring, the faith of a mustard seed, the patience of eternity, the depth of a family need. Then God combined these qualities when there was nothing more to add. He knew his masterpiece was complete, and so he called it Dad. Okay, shall we pray? <clears throat> Heavenly Father, I just thank you so much that you are my Heavenly Father, that you sent your only son to die on the cross for my sin and that I can spend eternity with you. Thank you for leading me, for guiding me, and taking care of me daily. I also pray, Lord, for all the dads uh, in this service. I pray for the grandpas and for um, people that are father figures for children that are alone, or but that they have made an influence of them. And there are many in this congregation. I pray that you will give them strength, maturity. It's hard to be a dad now or a father figure. I pray you will give them wisdom. It's said, Lord, that <clears throat> a boy's first hero is his dad. Give the men these courage to stand up and be that hero for the children in their life. A girl's first love is their daddy. I pray too, Lord, that you will just be with the dad so that they will show love and compassion and that these little ones can just know what to seek for when they're looking for a partner or someone uh, important in their life. I pray, Lord, for the fathers that maybe have been absent, absent either uh, through distance or choice, just give them grace, Lord. Help them to recognize um, that their children do need them. Help them to come to a saving knowledge and to just reach out to their children. I pray for the children that have been hurt by, by the, a distant father. Also help them, Lord, that they will um, not hold bitterness and let it be rooted in their heart, but they will show the love, compassion, and forgiveness that you show to us. Let them show it to their dads. Um, there's a, the Bible verses uh, of Psalm 22 and 6. Train up a child in the way he should go, and when he is old, he will not depart from it. And then, as uh, God told Moses to tell Aaron, the Lord bless and keep you. 
the Lord make his face to shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord turn his face toward you and give you peace. Praise God for the dads, and I pray that you will have an awesome day. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you, Tori and Pat. I have a small story. So Joy knows this. We, went, we were watching a movie one day, and, then, and it was a very sad movie where a little girl was sick, and I was about to cry. And she was doing laundry next to me. And then she was done with one basket, and I was about to cry. So I just grabbed a laundry basket and ran upstairs. I'm like, I got to take this laundry basket upstairs. And I just took it. <laughs> and so I, I, there's no laundry basket here, so I don't know how I can escape. Um, but uh, thank you for that. So uh, on to, uh, actually, before announcements, I want to invite the welcome team to take up the offering. I'm just going to pray into that. And then uh, after that, we'll do the offering. And this will be your chance to share your, your Connect card as well. Father, we thank you because you give us abundantly, Lord. And so we give back faithfully, Lord. Use it for your kingdom. Um, God, we, we leave it in your hands, and we trust in your sovereignty. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So just a few announcements uh, today. First is let's move NBCs back, um, the weekly walk. So that starts on Monday, June 24th at 7 p.m. So where we usually meet is the southeast corner of the Milton Sports Center. There's a big gazebo there um, and in the, near the parking lot. And so that starts on June 24th, 7 p.m. Uh, we do one or two loops. Each loop is 2.5 kilometers, so you have a chance to walk 2.5 or do double, so that's five kilometers. You can run, you can walk, you can chat, whatever works. Um, and if you're helping, if you're interested to help organize as well, uh, usually it's Matt and Donna Timpson that lead this, but if you're interested to help uh, be a guide in one of those or organize, please uh, email Matt uh, at matt at miltonbiblechurch.ca. The next announcement is uh, on Sunday, June 30th, and for the rest of the summer, we will be moving to one service at 10 a.m. Um, this is mainly because a lot of people go on summer holidays or they go to cottage, so we figured logistically we'll just go to one service, 10 a.m., starting uh, Sunday, June 30th. This is just for the summertime. In fall, we'll actually resume our two-service schedule. Um, I do want to take some time to thank everyone that has been doing double duty uh, for both services. And I'm sure God sees you and, and sees your heart and blesses you. And we thank you for that. And finally, for the last announcement, I'm going to invite, I'm going to invite Jake and Naomi to come and share about sports ministry, softball teams specifically. Uh, hello, church family. Uh, so our softball season kicked off a couple weeks ago, but uh, coming up we have, on Monday, we have a game between both NBC teams. We're playing each other for the first time. Yeah. Uh, so we just want to invite everyone to come out and show some support and just cheer for whichever team you decide to cheer for. Um, we can't promise a showcase of athletic prowess, but... We can promise that it will be fun, and we'll have some freezies and stuff after, and we'll all hang out in fellowship together, so. Yeah, so that's um, tomorrow, so Monday, and we play at 7 o'clock at the Brian Best Park, so that's right um, next to the Milton District High School, so we would love for you guys to come and just show your support, and it's going to be lots of fun, so yay! <laughs> all right, so before we dismiss our kids, I'm just going to pray. Father, I thank you for our children I pray, Lord God, that under the guidance of the parents in this room and the teachers that work so hard, Lord, that they may grow up, Lord, to be your children, first and foremost, to be leaders, Lord, um, not just in the church, but in the community, Lord God, in the jobs, um, in their jobs. And we pray, Lord God, that they may be salt and light. And so today we pray for wisdom and patience for the teachers, that, uh, and we are thankful for them and for all the hard work. Um, that you do for, for, our, for our children, Lord God. And so we dismiss them, Lord God, and we pray that you be with them. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So kids, you're dismissed, your classes. And at this point, I will invite Pastor Mark to introduce our guest speaker. Well, I'm excited today to have a guest speaker with us, uh, Dr. Peter Chu. I first got to know Peter about five years ago when I came on staff at the People's Church for what ended up only being a couple years. But one of the greatest uh, joys was getting to know people when I worked at People's Church. And uh, Peter is a lay speaker at People's Church. 
um, he became a great friend, someone I could do breakfast with and chat with, and uh, I loved getting his insight on things for a couple reasons. One, uh, he is a recently retired uh, surgeon, uh, trauma slash, I wrote it down here so I didn't remember, forget, uh, general surgeon from Sunnybrook Hospital. Uh, he's been retired for about one year, but he's also a professor of biblical studies at Tyndale Seminary, and on top of that, he and his wife, Keon, serve as medical missionaries through SIM, and I think he's going to share just a bit about that. Uh, Peter and uh, Hyun have two children as well, Charlotte and Katie. I'm so thankful Peter was available today. In fact, a year ago, I reached out to him and said, hey, Peter, would you come and preach here at Milton Bible Church one Sunday? And he said, I've just retired from my, my medical career, and I'm taking a year of sort of Sabbath just to shore up and rest and have that, but reach out in a year and let's see what we can do. And so I think it was like a year to the day. I think you were shocked when you emailed me back like, like, wow, this guy really wants me here. So, um, but I reached out and Peter said, yes, I'm available for Father's Day. So would you please uh, put your hands together, MBC, and give Dr. Peter Chu a warm welcome. Um, it is really good to be with you this morning. Um, Mark, thanks for the invitation. Thanks for asking me a year later. Um, when I... When I drove into the parking lot this morning, um, there was a lady just getting stuff out of the back of her car, and she made the effort to turn around and just wave to me. And I thought, oh, I'm in a great church. <laughs> so um, whoever that lady is, if you're here, if you're, or if you're teaching Sunday school, uh, thank you. And um, thank you to the worship team this morning. I, I love uh, worshiping with you. And I think there are times where a speaker comes, but the speaker is also supposed to listen. And this morning, the testimonies that were shared really spoke to me. I think the common theme was prayer. And I really appreciated those testimonies this morning from your congregation. Um, before I start, uh, I just want to, since we're on the theme of softball, I just want to share a story from uh, my church growing up. I grew up in a church in Ottawa, and we had a tradition of having a single men versus married men softball game at the annual church picnic, okay? and it was a big deal. <laughs> so, and we had just um, received a new pastor from the United States, and he was a, uh, he was a, he was, he wasn't kind of skinny uh, and a little small, and uh, and it was his first year, and they wanted him to play, so he said, "Okay, I'll play." And as the new pastor, he he knows he's got to win people over, and this game is a big deal. And he gets up to bat, and his wife is whispering to the ladies around her, those guys got to move back. They, they got to move back. No one knew that the pastor had played NCAA baseball. <laughs> he, 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 he played second base. He played second base for Ohio State. And he just crushed the ball. <laughs> like, it, just went, it just went forever. And the pastor from then on had no problems <laughs> in board meetings. <laughs> so um, I just love the fact you guys have a softball team. So it's great. Let's pray. Lord, we come before you this morning. We want to meet you. You are holy, you are good, and you are perfect in your power, in your purity, and your mercy towards us. May you open our eyes and show us wonderful things from your law. Amen. I've entitled the message today, Will You Get in the Boat? And the text is from Mark chapter 4, 35 to 41. And I thought um, a story about a boat is fitting for Father's Day. The only problem is as the story unfolds, you'll find that the boat does sail, but there's no fishing. So, um, but there is a boat. And um, I would like to begin, uh, as Mark mentioned, I just want to tell you a bit about myself and my family uh, so that you will see how God has been working this particular text, Mark chapter 4, in the life of uh, our family. So, this is my family, uh, my wife, Hyan, our two girls, Charlotte and Katie. And um, as Mark mentioned, Sunnybrook Hospital actually has been a big part of our family's life. My, my wife is a family doctor 
She looked after cancer patients. Both her and I worked at Sunnybrook Hospital. And our girls learned to ride their bikes in the long hallways at Sunnybrook Hospital. Um, and my, my older one actually would ride uh, down all eight parking levels. Uh, in, <laughs> and so the security, the security guards knew our, our little girls very well. Another big part of our lives uh, is the country of Niger. So it's in the kind of emerald green right in the center. And similar to Canada, on the next slide, you'll see that most of the cities in Niger are all along the southern border with Nigeria. Okay, because Nigeria is the United States of America uh, in Africa. So all the, country, all the cities in Niger are all along the southern border. The rest of the country is really sand. It's Sahara Desert, okay? And there are poor countries, and then there's Niger. So this is one of the UN annual rankings for economic development. And you'll see that Niger is in the bottom 10. It doesn't matter which ranking you poll because they're always in the bottom 10. Um, due to its lack of natural resources, historically Niger has been very peaceful. Everybody leaves it alone, okay? Except in the last decade, the country has become more volatile due to uh, radical religious forces in neighboring countries. And last year, uh, there was a military coup that overthrew the democratically elected government. Can I have the next slide, please? And for the last uh, 25 years, our family has had a connection to one of SIM's uh, mission hospitals in Niger. It's called Gomi Hospital. Um, and in the next slide, you'll see my, my wife doing her doctor thing. In the next slide, I'm doing my doctor thing. We provide, uh, our ministry is that of providing coverage so that long-term doctors can go on vacation, get to a conference, or go on home assignment. That's the ministry that we've uh, kind of fallen into. And, and since we return every year to the same place, um, we know the hospital, we know the team, there's no need to orient us. We're, we're, we're what we call, what, we're what people call plug and play short-term missionaries. You just kind of plug us in and we start doing our thing. In 2015, my wife actually stepped away from medicine and joined the international leadership team of SIM. And last year, as Mark said, um, I left surgery uh, to spend more time teaching at Tyndale. But I want to share that information with you so you have a context for um, how I'm bringing this message to you from Mark chapter four. So let's read the text today. And as we read it, I want you to pay attention to two things. First, the word great shows up three times. There's a great storm, there's a great calm, and then there's a great fear. And the text can be outlined based on the, the occurrence of the word great. So great storm, great calm, great fear. The other thing I want you to notice is that every time the word great appears, it's followed by a question. Okay, so let's read the text. On that day when evening had come, he said to them, let us go across to the other side. And leaving the crowd, they took him with them in the boat, just as he was. And other boats were with him. And a great windstorm arose, and the waves were breaking into the boat so that the boat was already filling. But he was in the stern, asleep on the cushion. And they awoke him and said to him, Teacher, do you not care that we are perishing? And he awoke, rebuked the wind, and said to the sea, Peace. Be still. And the wind ceased, and there was a great calm. He said to them, why are you so afraid? Have you still no faith? And they were filled with great fear and said to one another, who then is this that even the wind and the sea obey him? Well, the story begins with, on that day when evening had come, he said to them, let us go across to the other side. Get in the boat, go to the other side, okay? A couple of questions. Well, if we're going to the other side, what's on this side, okay? Well, this side, there were huge crowds following Jesus, listening to his teaching, watching him perform miracles. Jesus was widely and wildly popular. The disciples were his entourage, okay? The, the Jesus brand was exploding. This side is what is familiar, safe, secure, and successful. Well then, what was the other side? 
The other side was the southeastern corner of the Sea of Galilee. It was known as the Decapolis, Deca, ten, Paulus cities, ten cities that had been granted special status by the Roman uh, government. And the cities were mostly Greek and Roman in population and culture. It was definitely Gentile territory. The other side represents what's unknown, different, maybe difficult, even dangerous. That's the other side. Why did Jesus want to go to the other side? This side is great. We've worked hard to get where we are. Why leave? We're actually not told why he wants to go to the other side. Neither are the disciples, at least not yet. We also read that they took him as he was in the boat. What does Mark mean? Well, Jesus has spent the whole day teaching, and the crowd was so big and pressed in on him that he was pushed back to the edge of the water. And for the crowd to be able to see and hear him, he actually had, he got into a boat and had the disciples push off from shore. So what Mark is describing is after a full day of teaching, they didn't return back to shore. They didn't return to shore to get food, to rest. They just left right away in the boat. So the fourth question is, why the urgency? Why does he want to go to this side? Why the urgency? We're also not told the reason. But the disciples obeyed. They weren't given a reason. They just did it. Now, for at least four of the 12 disciples, we know that this sea was their home turf. They had grown up around this sea. They fished it. They knew this sea. So crossing the sea was not a problem. Crossing at night was not a problem. Most fishing was done either at night or in the early morning because the wind was calmer, the waves were less, and also because it was cool, the fish would come up from the bottom of the sea. So crossing at night was not a problem. Now, over the years, Hein and I have gotten into and out of many boats. Um, the medicine boat we were happy to get into. We were actually quite desperate to get into the medicine boat. Going to Niger in the medicine boat, that was sometimes quite challenging, but we were still willing to get into it. Now we're both out of the medicine boat and in other boats. But for all of us, we're always asked to get into boats. Where's the boat? The boat's in the dark. It's nighttime. And we know there's a storm coming. So the storm might have blotted out the moon if there was one. They're also in the middle of the sea, far from shore. Now, when the storm hits, what we read in the, in the ESV is, it's a great windstorm. Okay? It's actually three separate words. It's actually great storm wind. But all three are put together to communicate the intensity and the magnitude of the storm. It's not a rainstorm. It's a windstorm because the wind whips up the waves. Now, the nature of, the, of storms on the Sea of Galilee are very interesting. If I could have the next slide. So the Sea of Galilee actually sits inside a bowl. Okay? It's surrounded by cliffs. There are two gaps in the cliffs at the north end and at the south end. The wind comes in through the gap, whips around inside the bowl, and then as more wind comes in, that circular motion just increases the intensity of the wind. And that is the reason why the Sea of Galilee is known historically for sudden windstorms and the waves becoming suddenly very powerful and high. Okay. Now, how severe is the storm? You have seasoned fishermen that are terrified because their boat is filling with water and they know this will only end one way. Okay. Now, this image provides an explanation for storms in our lives. The literal storm connects with figurative storms that occur in our lives. What happens when a storm hits us? First, we're overwhelmed. It's beyond our resources and capabilities. 
Storms overwhelm. The second, we're not in control. They can't stop the wind. The waves are crashing in the boat. They can't keep up with the bailing the water. We're overwhelmed. We're not in control. There is a threat. There is a risk. Either physical harm, even death, or there is a risk of loss. Material, financial loss, loss of opportunity, loss of reputation. And lastly, storms are an obstacle. They are a barrier that stop or slow down our achieving our goals. Storms in our lives overwhelm us. We're not in control. They're a threat, and they are a barrier. Now, if you're tracking with the story, you might have made some observations that are a bit troubling. First, who's responsible for the storm? Well, if God is sovereign... Ultimately, he's responsible. Either he sent it or he allowed it. Now, the storm could simply be a storm. It's a natural event. Storms happen. It could also be supernatural. If it's supernatural, is it from God? Is it from Satan? Ultimately, if God is in control, he either sent it or he allowed it. That's a little troubling. Second, If Jesus is omniscient and he knows everything, he would have known there would be a storm. When he asked the disciples to get in the boat and go to the other side, he knew they would encounter a storm. So Jesus is deliberately leading them into the storm. So now there are three things Jesus hasn't told the disciples. Why are we going to the other side? Why the urgency? And there's going to be a storm, guys. He's withheld all that from them. And then third, the disciples obey Jesus and get in the boat in obedience, and there's a storm. Wait, Peter, isn't there another story where someone gets in a boat in disobedience and encounters a storm? Yeah, like Jonah runs from God, disobeys God, wants to go to the other side of the, the world, and he encounters a storm. Aren't storms supposed to happen when we disobey? Why is a storm happening to the disciples when they're obeying Jesus? And they're obeying Jesus without even understanding why. What's going on? I obey Jesus and I get a storm. That doesn't make any sense. When a storm hits and we're in the boat in obedience to Jesus, It's very natural to ask four questions. The first question is, was this a mistake? Did I not hear Jesus correctly? Well, in this story, Jesus clearly told them, we're getting in the boat, let's go to the other side. So it's not a mistake. Second question, why did we even think it might be a mistake? What's changed? Before there was a storm, I was certain... Jesus asked me to get in the boat. Now there's a storm, I'm not so sure. Because as the slide shows, we have an equation. Boat plus Jesus, okay, I'll obey him. Boat plus Jesus plus storm, all of a sudden, we're wondering, did I make a mistake? And it is natural to ask that question. But behind the question, we need to examine Did we obey because we had expectations? If I get in the boat, I'm expecting a nice, calm, sunset cruise, steaks grilling, cold drinks, no storm. Did we have expectations? Maybe we had a sense of obligation. God, if I obey you, you're obligated to make sure it's all smooth. The last one is, maybe we thought we were in a negotiation with God. God, I'll obey you, but in return, you're going to take care of me and my family and everything's going to be okay, right? The third question we may ask is, well, 
why would God send the storm? Sometimes it's to teach us something, sometimes it's to test us, sometimes it's just a storm. There's no moral element to the storm, it's just a natural event. It could be a spiritual attack. But at this point of the story, we're not told why God sends a storm or allows a storm. The reason is withheld from us and withheld from the disciples. The fourth question, though, I think is key. Where is Jesus? He's in the same boat, on the same sea, same storm, with the disciples. Except he's sleeping. <laughs> Big difference there. Okay? But he's with the disciples in the boat. Okay? Let's review what we've learned so far. Jesus asks us to get in the boat, go to the other side. Will we obey him? There may not be a reason, there may not be a purpose, there may not even be a plan or an itinerary, okay? Just get in the boat. Obedience does not exclude us from storms. In fact, we should expect storms. They're inevitable. Jesus' leading will take us into storms. Where's Jesus? He's in the boat, on the sea, in the storm, with us. We sang a song that was based on Psalm 23, His goodness is running after me. That psalm talks about being led in green pastures by quiet waters because He's guiding us in the paths of righteousness. The very next verse, His guidance takes us into the valley of the shadow of death. The green pastures, the quiet waters, the valley of the shadow of death are all part of his guidance in the right path. But David, the psalmist, fears no evil. Why? For you are with me. God, you're with me in the green pastures, the quiet waters, the valley of shadow of death, just like Jesus is in the boat with the disciples on the sea in the storm. Our family's time in Niger has had its share of storms. The first time I went in 1998, I had, I had grown up in a church in Ottawa that had a very strong missions program. So I grew up wanting to be a missionary doctor. And I, it took 16 years to get to Africa. And I get off the plane, and all I, all I get is, is a mouthful of dust. Because I didn't know when they asked me to help out that the time slot they gave me was hot season and the windiest and dustiest time of year. That's why no one volunteers at that time. <laughs> but I was too naive. I didn't know anything. I'll go. No one's going, I'll go. I get to the hospital and it's just nonstop work. There was no work-life balance. I, I started work at seven. I think I staggered home at nine. All the fruit and vegetable sellers were gone. I thought I was going to starve. And on top of that, there was tremendous conflict among the missionary team. And I was there for four months, and I thought, God, if this is what you want me to do, I can't do it. I, I just can't do it and survive at this, at this way and just the conflict among the missionaries. And I went home. I probably should have seen a counselor. <laughs> I didn't talk about my time in Africa for about six months. And like, I didn't, I didn't tell my wife who was in my fiance. I didn't talk to my family about it. I was just quiet. And um, I was wrestling with, if this is what you call me to do, I can't do it. I can't get in this boat. This storm is way too big. I'm going to drown. I'm going to end up completely burnt out uh, before 32. <laughs> My wife and I got married, and a year later, we spent our first year of marriage at the hospital. <laughs> and my wife realized what I had told her was true. <laughs> she, she, there was, it was the same storm. All I did was put her on a boat, we went back out to the same storm. And um, the, the conflict was still there. It was, probably, it was even worse. They actually had to call in a whole crisis team. The work was overwhelming, and my wife said, we can't do this. This is not healthy. And 
the way God worked it that was, I'm not asking you to do it this way. What I'm asking you to do is now you understand how hard it is. Until that system changes, I want you to come out so that the missionaries can get a break. And you give them the chance to go on vacation, take conferences, and go on home assignment. And that was the first storm. We were thought, we can't do this. Second, I mean, there are other sm smaller storms, like all your luggage gets lost. It, it arrives the day you leave. You, you all know those kind of storms. Okay? We both had malaria. And then in 2015, we decided to take our girls for the first time. We were going to go for six months and cover someone's home assignment. And our girls were eight and five. And the week before we were supposed to fly out, I'm not sure if some of you remember that, um, a magazine in France published a cartoon that mocked Muhammad. And uh, the Muslim world erupted, including the country of Niger. And um, there was rioting. They burned 72 churches. And this is the week before we were flying out. And um, my wife and I were wrestling with, oh, we can, we can be willing to get in the boat but should we take our two girls into the boat with us? And we decide to get in the boat. And the girls had probably the most transformative experience of their lives in those six months. We went back in 2019 as a family, <laughs> the week before we fly out. We were expecting something now because we had been prepared for the <laughs> four years earlier. Um, now there's... Um, there's radical Islamic groups in the country four years later. And a week before we flew out, um, they ambushed a Nigerian army convoy. They just wiped out 120 soldiers. And they, there was a security lockdown in the country. We weren't even sure the planes were landing. And we went back out there again. And again, God took care of our family, took care of all the missionaries, all the expatriates. And our girls had another great experience out there. But each time, my wife and I had to wrestle through all those questions. Is this a mistake? Did we not hear God clearly? Why is there a storm? Shouldn't it be smooth? God, like, we're doing all this for you. Why is there a storm? But he keeps showing us, hey, I'm with you in the storm. I got this. Let's go back to our story. The disciples asked, Teacher, do you not care that we are perishing? Same boat, same sea, same storm, completely different reaction. Now, their question is actually a rhetorical question. You don't care that we are perishing. They look at Jesus asleep, and when God is still and silent, we think he's abandoned us, that he doesn't care. If he's not doing what we want, when we want, how we want, we think he's walked away. That's where the disciples are. You don't care that we are perishing. Now, the interesting thing is they complain and they criticize, but they don't call out for help. You've got the God of the universe in the boat with you, and you don't ask for help. All you do is complain. Now, when I, when I realize that part of the story, I'm convicted because that's me. I complain and I criticize and I say, God, why did you do this? Why did you let this happen to me? When I've got the God of the universe that I can say, help me out of this. But I don't. All I do is complain and criticize. Right? The reason they didn't ask for help, we'll find out at the very end of the chapter, they didn't think Jesus could do anything about the storm. They had put Jesus in a little box. The box was too small. What does Jesus do? Now, I actually think he was a little annoyed they woke him up. Okay? Jesus got up. He awoke, rebuked the wind, and said to the waves, quiet, be still. Okay? Now, I want you to notice the four verbs. Jesus awoke. Okay? Better way to translate is probably he roused himself. Okay. It wasn't that he passively just woke up because they were making so much noise. He actually got up. So Jesus responds and he acts to save the disciples. 
Secondly, he rebukes the wind. Rebuke has the idea of putting something back in its place. Something's out of place, out of order. Jesus puts it back in order. Quiet, be still. They're really synonyms. But what you're seeing is a theme that is present from Genesis 1. When God speaks, it's true and it happens. Immediate control. What God says happens. And Jesus is actually using exorcism language here. That's the power that he's commanding. The result, a great calm. The term Mark uses is actually a sailing term. It refers to water that is so still, it's glass. You can see the clouds reflected in it. And it's immediate. There is no waiting for the storm to die down. It's immediate. Jesus then asks the question, why are you so afraid? Have you still no faith? Okay, can I have the next slide? Yeah. Oh, sorry, and the next one after that. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Why are you so afraid? Have you still no faith? Now, I've highlighted in red the modifiers. So instead, if you take the modifiers out, the questions become: Why are you afraid? Have you no faith? The questions are an observation. This is what you don't have. This is what you do have. You have fear, no faith, just an observation. But Jesus adds the modifiers in. Why are you so afraid? He's measured them. There's an expectation. Their fear is beyond expectation. You shouldn't be so fearful. Have you still no faith? He's measuring their faith. Their fear is beyond expectation. Their faith is below expectation. You should not be where you are at this time. He's rebuked the wind, and now he's rebuking the disciples. He's putting, he's reminding them of their proper place. After the time that you've spent with me, you shouldn't be here. This is the place you should be. Now, you would think that with this calm that suddenly descends after Jesus speaks, the disciples would be reacting in awe and joy. But no. He had just said, why are you so scared? Why do you have no faith? Their response is, great fear. <laughs> okay? They were filled with great fear. Okay? The exact opposite. Okay? Why? The storm's gone. What are they scared of? Jesus. They are scared of Jesus. Who then is this? Who's in the boat with us? This is not a normal dude. Who do we have in the boat? The fear is Jesus exploded out of their box, and they're reeling. What's happening? Notice what they say. Even they had expectations too. Even the wind and the waves, even the wind and the sea obey him. They didn't expect him to be able to do that. They didn't meet Jesus' expectations. Jesus exploded theirs. Now, the reason for their fear is, in their mindset back then, wind and water were primal forces that were uncontrollable and unpredictable. And their goal was to destroy. The gods were seen as deities that were constantly battling these primal forces, an unending battle, rebuking them, putting them back in their place. To watch Jesus command wind and water absolutely blew their minds. They had seen him heal people. They had even seen him raise someone from the dead. They did not think he could do this. Now, if we stop here, we have four big ideas. The first is obedience. Will we get in the boat 
and go to the other side. The second, if we get in the boat, expect storms. The third, where's Jesus? He's in the boat with us. Because he's in the boat, we respond in fear. We, sorry, we respond in faith and not fear. We, we ask the same questions. It's very natural. God, don't you care if we drown? Why are we so afraid? Do we still have no faith? Who is this? Even the wind and the waves obey him. Now, most of the time, we stop the message here because it's the end of the chapter, and you can't preach across a chapter, right? <laughs> now, the problem, though, is if we stop here and we don't go across a chapter, there's one question that's unanswered. Why did Jesus want to go to the other side? After all that, we still don't know why he wanted to do that. To get that answer, you have to cross the chapter. Okay? Now, if we keep going... You're familiar with the story. The disciples arrive. They spent the, whole, they, they, they spent the whole day with Jesus ministering, the whole night battling the storm. They're cold, they're wet, they're tired, they're hungry. All they want to do is get a fire going, dry out, rest, get some food. Okay? Jesus has another plan. There is this shrieking that's coming from the hills, and this man comes running down. It's a demon-possessed man. The disciples think, wait a second, Jesus. Look, let's just get some food. Let's get dried out. Let's not get involved. Only nasty things are here. Nasty things that good Jewish boys should stay away from. Okay? That man clearly is not Jewish. He's demon-possessed. We're in Gentile territory. There is a graveyard, and there's 2,000 pigs. This is all not good stuff for Jewish people. Okay? You know what happens. Okay? Jesus delivers the man. The crowd comes out, they beg Jesus to leave. They're terrified. Who is this? Even the wind of the waves obey him? The demons obey him? The pigs went over the cliff? That's 2,000 pigs. Okay. The man begs Jesus, can I go with you? The man says, Jesus, can I get in your boat? Jesus says, I have a different boat for you. I want you to go back to your family and to your community and tell them what God has done for you. The disciples, okay, let's get some food, let's get tried out, let's get some rest. If you read chapter 5, what does Jesus do? Hey guys, let's just get right back in the boat, go back to where we came from. Yeah, if you're the disciples, you're thinking, what? We just interrupted ministry on the other side, spent a whole night in a storm. We dealt with this shrieking, screaming, demon-possessed man, and now we're getting back in the boat? We did all that for this one man? That's why Jesus wanted to go to the other side and to go immediately for that one man. Do you think the disciples wondered, that wasn't worth it? When we catch ourselves saying, that was not worth it, a couple of points to consider. First, when we say that was not worth it, are we really saying he or she was not worth it. We've assigned value to an individual and they didn't measure up to us. Second point to consider is we may say that was not worth it, but are we really saying he or she was not worthy of me? My effort, my sacrifice, my time, my money. When do we decide if it's worth it to get into the boat? First, we can decide before we get in the boat. We don't actually want to get in the boat. So we do a cost-benefit analysis, and we present to God 
our business case for not getting in the boat, okay? God, the return on investment is really poor. It's not a strategic use of resources, i.e., I'm the resource, okay? <laughs> we present our business case to God. This is a bad idea, God. God, didn't you think this through? Because I've thought it through. Here's my analysis, okay? We will also assess, is it worthwhile while we're in the boat? Okay? And the storm hits, and we're wondering, this isn't worth it. And then lastly, we'll look at worth, if it's worthwhile when we actually arrived to the other side. We got in the boat, we rode out the storm, we got to the other side because we're expecting God to give us an amazing ministry. We get to the other side and we're underwhelmed. Not overwhelmed, we're underwhelmed. This is why you had me get in the boat? These people, this group, this turnout? And we decide, that wasn't worth it, God. Who decides if it's worth it? It's God. That's why Jesus never invited the disciples into the discussion of why he wanted to go to the other side. It was none of their business. God decides if it's worth it. Our responsibility is to get in the boat. The story's not over. If you flip two chapters along in the Mark 7, Jesus returns to that same region. But this time, the response is completely different. The crowd actually brings a deaf man to Jesus, and instead of begging Jesus to leave, they beg Jesus to heal the deaf man. What's the difference in the two chapters? The man that Jesus had delivered went back, he got in his boat, went back to his family community, and told them what God had done for him. See, God knew I don't need Jesus and the disciples in Decapolis, but I'm going to use this man to tell the story of salvation and God being good in Decapolis. God knew it was worth it. After being in Niger for about 20 years, um, the missionaries have an annual spiritual life conference. And they usually invite a, a pastor from one of the missionaries' homes, home churches, or um, a Bible teacher to come out and speak. And um, in 2019, they actually asked me, would you be willing to be the conference speaker? And I said, you got to be kidding me. Uh, I mean, I put people back together at the hospital. I, I can't be your conference speaker. And they said, no, we want you to be the conference speaker. And I said, why? And they said... Our speakers come out, they have no connection to us. They fly in, they have their canned talks, and they fly out. They don't know the context of our lives. And they said, you know what we go through, and we want you to speak from that experience. And um, the, after the first message, I, it was one of those moments where the room just gets quiet because God's Spirit is present. And I went back to uh, where I was staying, and I started crying because I suddenly realized in order to speak three times for 40 minutes, God sent me to Niger for 20 years, once a year. Now, if you had asked me in 1998, if you could speak three times for 40 minutes, but you would have to go to this place once a year for 20 years, I would have said, no way. That cost-benefit analysis is crazy. I'm so glad I don't get to decide if something is worth it. Will we get in the boat? go to the other side. If you've gotten into the boat and you're riding out the inevitable storm, 
I want to encourage you to just keep your eyes on Jesus. He's in the boat with you. And trust that God has decided it's worth it. Now, it's Father's Day. If we as fathers do not get in the boat and go to the other side, how will our children ever get in the boat? What are the boats Jesus is asking us to get into in our personal, professional, and public lives? What are the boats he's asking us to prepare our families and to lead our families to get into? Second, as fathers, fathers-to-be, what is our response when we're in the boat and the storm hits? Are we flailing around in fear? Or do we just keep our eyes on Jesus because he's in the boat with us? Our children watch how we respond to storms. They learn from us. Is it a response of fear or is it a response of faith? And then lastly, when Jesus asks us to get in the boat, is our obedience conditional on a cost-benefit analysis? We do the analysis first, and then we go to God, okay, I'll obey you, or no, I don't think I'm going to obey you on this one. What are our children seeing? Is our Christianity a selective, conditional, kind of boutique Christianity that's on our terms? Or if we're told to get in the boat, we get in the boat. Now, I've talked about children. But as fathers and as husbands, our response to getting in the boat, our response to storms, whether or not it's selective obedience, it affects our wives. We can be the greatest encouragement or discouragement to our wives in their walk with God. For fathers who are in the boat, riding out the storm, and you're keeping your eyes on Jesus, I just want to encourage you to just keep doing it. Because what you're doing is the right thing. And God sees it, and he will honor it. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you this morning for the opportunity to worship you and to meet you in the pages of your word. We ask that your spirit would bury what we've heard and sung and prayed this morning into our hearts and lives in the coming weeks and months. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Amen. Great. Thank you. Amen. Thank you, Dr. True, for the great message today. If, if you're about to step into a boat or you are within a boat, I encourage you to come and spend some time in prayer with the prayer teams on my left and my right. The, I promise you the return on investment on that one is really high. Uh, so please, I encourage you to come, step forward, prayer from our faithful prayer warriors here. Uh, for the rest of us, uh, I encourage you to step outside so just we can leave this uh, space as a sacred space and have coffee with each other and connect with each other. May you have a blessed week.